Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson. It's the fourth anniversary week of the disaster at Fukushima Daiichi. I'm in England this week, testifying in front of the House of Commons and then going up to Cumbria to discuss new reactors that are also proposed up there. We thought we'd share with you this week what Fairwinds did four years ago on radio and television. You know, you've come accustomed to believing in what we've had to say, and this is an example of how we've spoken truth to power for the last four years. Thanks from all of us at Fairwinds. You're here. This is Ofunata, Japan. You see the debris still in the streets five days after, hills around up here, but down here in this little valley, the destruction from the tsunami. You see the debris everywhere. This town where rescue operations are underway as we move into day five. Hopes of finding survivors are dwindling, but people are still looking. It's just stunning, the devastation. Everywhere you look on the building, you find scars from something hitting it as the waters came through. We heard ambulances in that shot just a short time ago. As we're watching this unfold, the search and rescue effort, hopefully a search and rescue effort, we're also watching a dramatic breaking story tonight. Another fire, another fire at a nuclear complex where all six reactors are under some st stages of distress. And Arnie Gunderson is back with us. He's a nuclear expert. And I want to talk to you, sir, about reactor number four. We know that the fire was up here near the roof area. We know just below that roof are the spent fuel rods. You described earlier in the program just how dangerous and risky this could be. We know among the options that were being debated, and we're told on Japanese public television, at least at the moment, the option has been taken off the table, was they need to get water up here somehow to cool these spent fuel rods. They were thinking about using helicopters. Good idea or bad idea? Uh, that's a really bad idea, and I'm really glad they took it off the table. The, the problem is that the gap between the fuel is really, really critical, and I'm going to use my hands here. The gap is designed to be whatever, but if it's hit by water, it could push the gap close together. And what that could do is f cause a nuclear criticality. It could cause a nuclear chain reaction to occur. Then all bets are off. You know, you, we've been dealing so far with decay heat from an old nuclear criticality but the fuel pool itself could begin to have a chain reaction if the water hit it too hard and push the fuel too close together. So, Not a good thing. I'm glad they stopped. And so, Mr. Gunderson, help me. I'm going to change the image here in the wall. I'm going to bring up a different image. I want you to tell me that we know earlier in the other reactors, in reactor number two, for example, the problem was down here near the core. They were pumping ocean water in through this pump from the bottom. If you can see, there's a pump line coming in here. But the spent rods are up higher in the building up here. If you don't want to use helicopters, what are your options to get the water up there? Um, that's a really good question. You know, the, what I've heard this afternoon and this evening was that the, the building is too radioactive to have people in. So my guess is they'll have to go in with some kind of a ladder truck, you know, a, 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 a fire truck with a really long ladder and, um, and try to squirt the water in through the ladder. Um, How much time do I, they I have? I don't think the... Excuse me? How much time do they have before this is catastrophic? Um... It can boil dry in a day, so they have, you know, on the order of 24 hours to straighten it out. On the order of 24 hours, and if it boils dry, what happens? Uh, the, the fuel catches fire, the steel, the, the, the zircaloid begins to burn, and the um, radiation within the fuel uh, volatilizes and becomes, a, becomes an aerosol, it becomes airborne. Arnie Gunderson, this is a very sober assessment. We appreciate your expertise. You've had experience building these spent fuel rods shacks and we appreciate your expertise tonight i can't tell you i enjoy what i'm hearing uh, but i'm glad we're getting it from someone who knows this so well mr gunderson thank you so much so we're here with arnie gunderson chief engineer of fairwinds associates and uh, arnie's here to uh, talk to us a little bit about the current status of the fukushima plant in japan uh, so where does it sit now well it's um it's march 17th and um they have tried unsuccessfully to dump water on the reactor through helicopters. And then separately, though, they've also tried to shoot water in through the side. Um, most of those, event, of those uh, uh, mitigators were, uh, were unsuccessful. As I understand it, the, um, the, the hoses were forced to withdraw because they uh, were getting too high a radiation exposure. Apparently on Unit 3, they were able to get some water in because they saw lots of steam going out. 
Uh, the steam is not a good sign. It means there's a hole in the containment and radiation is leaking out and lots of radiation is leaking out. Um, but yet, given the alternative, they have to get water in that core. The fuel pool on Unit 4 is still dry and that would act like a giant x-ray machine. Um, the site will be exposed to x-rays because um, that the water in that fuel pool was designed to cool it down. How is the site currently being monitored for radiation? Well, there's three kinds of radiation. The first kind is gamma rays, and that's what the decimeters use that the uh, employees are wearing and that people in the public are reading. You know, a Geiger counter measures gamma rays. And they pass right through your clothing, they pass right through the protective clothing on these uh, people, and um, uh, that's the easiest form of radiation to measure. And at least for the people on site, it's the most damaging because it's such a high gamma ray background. The, um, the other two forms, though, are, uh, are dangerous for other reasons. There's things called beta particles and, and, and alpha particles. and um, those can't pass through your skin. So if they're outside you floating by and they decay, nothing's going to happen. But if you inhale it or if you eat it or it touches your skin and it works its way through your skin, now they're under the skin and they're up against an organ and can do uh, extraordinary damage in comparison to a gamma ray. So. The gamma rays are bad from the outside and you can't stop them. But when you see these guys in the bubble suits uh, working in that environment with the respirators on, that's not designed to protect gamma rays. That's designed to keep them from breathing in the alpha and the beta particles. So we talk about the uh, radioactive particles and the gamma rays. Uh, how would someone in the, who's exposed to what? Is someone in the city of Tokyo uh, potentially exposed to gamma rays or particles? When um, the people in, in Tokyo have radiation detectors and they'll see peaks in gamma rays, and what that means is that a cloud of uh, radioactive um, xenon and krypton has come over the city and those gases emit gamma rays. But it, it's not measuring things like the, uh, the cesium or the iodine or the strontium that, they, that also may be in that cloud. If it bumps up against the detector, those particles won't be measured because they can't get through the detector. But they are breathing them in, and so there is an inhalation exposure, and there could be you know, on their tongue or on their skin. That's why they're telling people to wash their clothes, and when you go outside, make sure you wash afterward. I think many people want to know, how, how does this all end? It's not something you can flick a switch and end. Um, these reactors will be radioactive and hot, physically hot, for, uh, for years. So when they squirt water in, steam is going to come out because now the containment has a hole in it. Um, and that steam is also going to carry radioactivity because the fuel is damaged. So when they turn on the pumps and begin to cool this reactor, if they can, um, that will be an important step forward, but it's not going to stop the radiation from coming out. The hole in that containment will continue to leak radiation until they fix a hole, and I have no clue how you do that. Well, what is it going to take, Art Gunderson, to clean this all up? I, I think the best example is Chernobyl. Um, Chernobyl is not cleaned up, but what they did was they put a concrete building around the concrete building. They call it a sarcophagus. Um, and it's designed to stay there for tens if not hundreds of years to prevent this radiation from going anywhere else. Um, that could easily be, for a site like this, tens of billions of dollars, or the B. Um, ultimately, it will... Uh, a clean nuclear plant like uh, Oyster Creek or Vermont Yankee or Pilgrim costs about $750 million to clean up. Um, but a dirty plant like Three Mile Island costs billions and there's six dirty plants. So ultimately when they get in and remove those plants, it's probably a $20 billion proposition to remove those six plants after they've been stabilized. 
and the stabilization could easily be a $10 billion problem. All right, Ernie Gunderson, Fairwinds Associates. Thank you. Turning now to provide some important perspective, nuclear experts Sharon Squassoni and Arnie Gunderson. Uh, uh, Sharon, let me start right there. You've traveled to Japan frequently. Uh, help our viewers here in the United States understand uh, the cultural significance. You heard Anna right there talking about how older, older workers who understand these plants are essentially being encouraged to volunteer because essentially, I hate to say it this way, they are closer to the end uh, anyway than younger workers. Right. Um... I think, you know, especially in Asian cultures, uh, age is uh, considered a, a, to be a venerable thing. Uh, the older you are, the more respect you get. I suppose the bright side of this is that they are also more likely to be uh, workers who are very familiar with the plant. Um, it is a recognition, I think, though, that uh, the radiation um, exposure is quite significant for these people. Uh, Arnie Gunderson, uh, you're very familiar with this specific design. You could probably walk blindfolded <clears throat> through one of these plants. Uh, take us inside. Take us inside. When you hear about those spent rods in, that, in reactor number four with the pool drained completely, you hear at least two of the containment vessels, I believe it's number two and number three, if I have the numbers right, have at least cracks in them. And you watch this complex play out. Uh, t take us inside. What's going on in there? Well, first off, you know, you can imagine a fireman in a, in a full body suit with a respirator and an air pack on um, in the dark, in hot environment, probably carrying extra equipment. And, um, uh, and on top of that, entering an area where there's been explosions and it's likely that there's rubble. Well, that's there plus radiation. Uh, so now these guys have to watch their decimeter as well as worry about all of those those features. Um, I, I guess the the problems are really exacerbated by the darkness and the rubble. And uh, the 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 question is, when you get to a spot where you have to be, like near the fuel pool, you have very limited stay time. Um, maybe you can stay ten minutes, maybe five. I hired employees that could only stay on the job for three minutes before they exceeded their personnel exposure. So you get all suited up and you do all of that and maybe you can do three to five minutes worth of work. And Sharon, if you can only do three to five minutes worth of work and we already know they're having trouble getting a significant water supply up there, we know they don't have constant electricity because the power was wiped out by the tsunami, uh, it leaves you with the impression that they're getting very, very little done at a time. That's why it's taking so long. Well, that could be. Uh, certainly, depending on the f levels in that spent fuel pool uh, and, and the rate of water shooting out of this uh, hose, uh, you know, it could take quite a while to fill it back up. But again, you know, we just don't know uh, how much um, you know, how much water, if any, is left in that spent fuel pool. But the issue uh, that Arnie highlighted is correct. You know, you've got to swap out these workers. There has to be a, a good organization so that they can pick up the tasks uh, that, uh, that their, the person before them has done. Uh, Arnie Gunderson, let me just ask it bluntly this way. Again, you're very familiar with this design. You've worked on this exact same model. What would you do differently? Um, I, I think I would have acknowledged ahead of time, uh, I would have acknowledged as soon as the event happened that um, the situation was much more out of control than, than Tokyo Electric did. You know, wrapping around to the beginning of your show, I don't think Tokyo Electric was not telling the truth, but they didn't tell enough information soon enough. What they told was probably true, but they didn't tell enough of it, and they didn't tell enough of it quick enough. It, it has been described already. Secretary Chu today called it, Arnie, uh, worse than Three Mile Island. Uh, based on everything you know tonight, is there a chance that it will be worse than Chernobyl? I actually think it's at Chernobyl level right now. Uh, you know, you have four different reactors. Uh, a year ago... Uh, the worst case imaginable was 1% fuel failure with a containment that leaked a tenth of a percent per day. That's what we thought was the worst that could happen. 
and now we're finding 70% fuel and a containment with a hole in the side of it. Uh, this is uh, 100 times worse than the worst case we imagined a year ago. A sobering, sobering, sobering perspective. Arnie Gunderson, Sharon Squassoni, appreciate both of you so much. I'm Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates. I wanted to talk to you today about the radiation releases that are coming from the Fukushima nuclear reactor complex. First off, I wanted to take a look at the slide that's up right now. It's the same one that was on in my previous presentation, but we're going to look at a different spot. Do you see those tall, um, tall pointy structures around the nuclear reactors? They sort of look like transmission towers. Well, they're not. They're called stacks, like a smokestack, except it's not smoke that goes up them, but radioactive gases. Now, they're there for a purpose. They were there because engineers believed that you could vent the um, nuclear radiation after an accident up a stack and get better dispersion. In other words, it was designed to throw that radiation high in the air so it would disperse well. They're not working. And the reason they're not working is twofold. First, there's large fans that are required to push the air up those stacks. Well, fans require electricity, and there's no, there's no electricity at Fukushima right now. So for the entire first 11 days of the, of the nuclear accident, those stacks have not worked. Well, there's a second problem, too. Those stacks were designed to suck air out of the containment buildings. And, you know, as the picture indicates, there's not much of a building left to suck air out of. So because the walls had exploded, there's no air to be, there's no uh, air to be drawn through and then up the stacks. So even if the stacks were working with the buildings failed, there, there would be no release up those stacks. That's not good. What does it mean? Well, well when engineers design an accident calculation, they assume that the fuel fails at a rate of about 1%. At Fukushima, they believe that the fuel has failed, about 70% of the fuel has failed. They also assume only one reactor fails. At, at Fukushima, we've got three reactors and the spent fuel pools, so there's as many as seven or eight reactor cores involved. The other thing is that they assume that the nuclear reactor containments leak at about half a percent per day. And at least on Unit 2, uh, most experts believe that the, the, the containment is breached, which means it's clearly leaking more than half a percent per day. And the final thing they do when they assume an accident calculation, they assume that those gases get pulled out and up those stacks. And that's not happening either. So what's happening instead is called a ground level release. Now the next slide is from a, a video that's been on the web. It's a, a helicopter or airplane flyby of the plant. And I've chosen to take a look at, at, at second 37 on the, on, the, on the video. It's only a one minute video though. It's kind of uh, devastating. But if you look at second 37, there's smoke or steam coming out the side of a building. And it's not going up, it's actually rolling down. Now that's called building wake effect. And you'll see it on a snowy day where the snow blows across the roof. It doesn't waft up into the air. It rolls. It tumbles down the side of the building. What that has the net effect of doing at Fukushima is causing the radiation to lie near the ground. Now, there's evidence in the environment that that's occurring. Uh, it's pretty clear to me that the area immediately outside the plant will be contaminated for a long, long time. And I would not imagine people returning to their homes anytime soon. But even out at the 30 and 40 kilometer mark, 20 or 30 miles out, um, we're beginning to see significant contamination, which you wouldn't see if the stacks were working. So what's my source? My source is the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Association, and agency rather, excuse me. Um, but their data from yesterday shows that the um, areas out as far as 30 and 40 kilometers are seeing a background radiation of about 1,600 times what normal background is. 
Now, that's coming from a cloud of gases that, that is hanging over the land right now. Those gases are xenon and krypton, and they're called noble gases. If you remember your, um, their high school chemistry, they're way on the right-hand side of the periodic chart. They don't react with anything, but they do emit gamma rays, which are causing the cloud exposure that, that everyone is exposed to. By the way, they also decay to other isotopes like strontium, uh, so that even when they're gone, uh, they leave daughter products behind that get deposited on the soil. So the other thing the IAEA found was surface contamination, and that's particularly disturbing. The surface contamination is 0 0.9 megabecquerels per square meter. Now, you know what a square meter is? It's roughly a, 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 a three feet by three feet, a little bit bigger. And a megabecquerel is a million disintegrations every second. So what the IAEA has determined is that the ground is contaminated with some beta isotopes and some gamma isotopes, but it's contaminated with radioactive material to the tune of 900,000 disintegrations per second. And this isn't on the plant site. This is 30 or 40 kilometers away. Now, in comparison, and it's not an exact comparison, but it's pretty good, at Chernobyl, the IAEA considered a hot spot if the beta contamination exceeded 500,000 disintegrations every second, or 0 0.5 megabecquerels per square meter. So this is on the, on the same realm as what a radioactive hot spot was considered at by the IAEA after Chernobyl. It's a serious concern, and it's not going to go away soon. These reactors will continue to leak for a long time. Um, I will keep you informed. That's it for today. Thank you. Well, now concerning that situation in Japan, I'm now joined live from Vermont by Arnold Gunderson. He's an energy advisor at Fairwinds Associates, a corporation specializing in environmental, nuclear safety, and energy issues. Mr. Gunderson, thanks so much for joining us live here on RT. Now, we're reporting at the moment that there are suggestions that a partial nuclear meltdown is now underway. Can you explain to us what does that mean exactly? Um, yeah, what it means is that the nuclear fuel has become brittle, uh, and that's evident because of the hydrogen explosions that have occurred. That process makes nuclear fuel brittle. And the pieces of nuclear fuel inside are about as big as my pinky, that joint on my pinky. They have all fallen into the bottom of the nuclear reactor. There are thousands and thousands of those pieces. In the center of those pieces is molten uranium. Um, it's, this is not a nuclear chain reaction. This is not a, a nuclear bomb. This is the radiation left over after the chain reaction has started. Um, this, this will go on for several months, and um, the heat's got to be removed. Okay. And if you can't... Okay, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but you say this is not a nuclear bomb, but would not the effects be the same as a nuclear bomb if, obviously, it does reach meltdown and there is an explosion? The chemicals that are going to be released are similar. Actually, the chemicals released from a radioactive chemicals released from a nuclear bomb disappear quicker than the radiation that uh, is released in a nuclear power plant. The uh, fission spectrum in a nuclear power plant has longer lived radiation than the fission spectrum in a, uh, in a bomb. But are we looking at an apocalypse? Uh, I, I read online reports on websites looking at international newspapers. That word is used many times. Exaggeration or is that true? Well, uh, my term is this is Chernobyl on steroids. This, is, uh, this will be worse than Chernobyl. Exactly how much worse, I don't know, but um, it's pretty clear to me that, uh, that it will be worse than Chernobyl. You say will be. Do you think it's definitely going to happen, or do you think crisis could be averted? No, I don't think crisis can be averted. Uh, these can, uh, the radiation exposures are so high on site 
that I don't think um, human beings can uh, can get into the areas that need to be accessed in order to put the fire um, to put the fires out and also to get water into the locations where the um, the, the heat is the highest. Worse than Chernobyl, so you I, say. So what will be the effects, not just for those people in the vicinity, who we understand are being evacuated in just a 12-mile radius, but what about Tokyo, where radiation levels are at, at 10 times above the norms at the moment, and beyond Tokyo, the atmosphere, the sea, the, the, the Asiatic region? Well, I think uh, you're, you're, if there's any lucky thing that's happened so far, it's the wind has mainly been blowing out to sea. If the wind turns to the, to the south, I, I expect you will see radiation in Tokyo. I don't believe it will be enough to evacuate Tokyo, but <clears throat> I think it would be prudent to take precautions and, and uh, you know, try to stay out, stay out of, the, uh, of the plume. You know, the Asiatic region, uh, they're already beginning to reroute airlines because they're afraid of the, the radiation landing on the airplane. And, you know, a, a plane from, uh, from Tokyo to Moscow, for instance, will fly through that plume. So it's, it will definitely begin to affect Asiatic travel pretty but much I, I, immediately. I appreciate you're an, an energy advisor. Um, you're a specialist in environmental, nuclear safety and energy issues. But your message, some people may say, is scaremongering. Uh, you, can we be absolutely sure this is going to happen? Because it's a very different message that the people in Japan are getting from the government or do you think the government are not telling them the truth I don't think the government is lying I do think the government is not telling them everything it knows you know I studied Chernobyl and I was an expert witness on Three Mile Island and the government is always behind the eight ball on these things they are deliberately trying to downplay the amount of radiation being released you know we saw it in the Gulf of Mexico too with the oil spill they underestimated the amount of oil. That seems to be the way bureaucracies work. Let me just quickly ask you about the uh, International Atomic Agency. It's just reacting now to the crisis, promising to send a team to Japan. Many people will criticize it for not acting fast enough. Are those criticism, criticisms justified, do you think? Oh, absolutely. The International Atomic Energy Commission estimated 5% of the core had failed. In fact, 70% had failed. So these guys have come in with low ball estimates for quite a few days now. Could it have done anything though, the IAEA? Could it have physically help before now? I don't think there's anything an expert can do to physically help at this point. I think these reactors are on runaway. Arnold Gunderson, very interesting to hear what you have to say. We appreciate your time. Energy advisor, okay. Fairwinds Associates, corporation specializing, as I say, in environmental, nuclear safety and energy issues, joining us live in Vermont. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds Associates. It's Tuesday, March 29th, 2011. Several things in the news have come up in the last several days that I wanted to uh, share my impressions uh, with you. Um, they are the fact that uh, plutonium has been discovered on the Fukushima site. The second, that large quantities of very radioactive water have also been discovered on site. And the last is I wanted to give you my assessment of the condition of the nuclear cores in um, units one, two, and three. First, the plutonium. Plutonium has been found on five different locations on site. And if you remember an earlier video I put together, uh, plutonium is a difficult isotope to detect because um, it doesn't give off a gamma ray, it gives off an alpha particle, and that's not picked up by the traditional Geiger counters. That plus the high background on site makes it very difficult. So this had to be from soil samples. So five soil samples have turned up plutonium. If there's five, there's more, and um, uh, that's a great concern for me. Uh, plutonium got its name from Pluto, the god of hell, and it's uh, one of the more nasty isotopes um, uh, that mankind has ever created. Um, this is a gram. The dollar bill is roughly a gram. Well, if you cut that into a million pieces, you have a microgram, smaller than George Washington's eye. One microgram can cause a lethal cancer from plutonium. Now, the, I believe the plutonium is coming from the uh, fuel pool in unit, uh, in unit four, although um, you can't rule out the other three reactors. Um, plutonium is um, uh, evident in all the nuclear reactors. Um, unit three had some plutonium fuel, but all the reactors will have plutonium because the uranium-238 absorbs a neutron and becomes plutonium anyway. 
So it's in all four locations. The reason I think it's in the pool though is that it's scattered on the land on the site. And the uh, most likely way to volatilize the uh, plutonium would have been in a, uh, in a, a fire or a violent um, zerk water reaction in, in the Unit 4 fuel pool. Um, there's still a lot more data that needs to be developed, but again, if you found five samples, it's likely there'll be more on site. And a bigger concern to, my, to me is that if it's already in five locations on site, I think they'll find more off site. Uh, and its health consequences should not be downplayed by uh, Tokyo Electric. The, uh, the second thing is the fact that the uh, enormous quantities of highly radioactive water have been found in trenches. These trenches are outside the nuclear containment. That means the containment isn't containing. Um, I posted a, a, a link that's on, on our site as well that talks about how radioactive material can get out of the nuclear reactor and get through the containment and out into these trenches without a breach of the containment and without a breach of the nuclear reactor. Um, it, it involves a leakage of a seal at the bottom of these nuclear reactors and, um, and it's quite plausible and I urge you to take a look at it in detail. Well, what does this mean? The amount of water in those trenches is enormous and it's very difficult to get uh, demineralizers to remove that radioactivity uh, in such high quantities. Basically, if the, if the demineralizer uh, absorb that radioactivity, it would become so radioactively hot that um, personnel couldn't go near it. I've also had people say, well, why don't you take that water and pump it back in the nuclear reactor? Well, the radioactivity in that water is over 100 rem per hour. And basically that means that anybody who stands near it for three or four hours receives a lethal dose of radiation. So if you were to pump it back into the reactor, the pumps would become so radioactive that personnel couldn't operate the pumps. There's not much tankage space available on the site. They're trying to pump that water into the unit condensers. The condensers are not seismic and may not have withstood the, uh, the earthquake and tsunami. So I think that water is leaking into the ocean. The quantity of radioactivity that's been detected in the ocean is an indication of an enormously large source of water of radioactive water hitting the ocean. I don't think it came from air releases. I think somewhere there is a leak into the ocean from this material. Um, it's a troubling, really troubling scenario because the containment isn't containing. The uh, last thing I wanted to talk to you about is the fact that the core damage appears to be minimized by, the, uh, uh, by Tokyo Electric. Um, I, was, uh, I had staff working for me when I was the vice president uh, on Three Mile Island during the recovery. And I got to view the videos of the core damage at Three Mile Island. Now we're putting one slide up here. Uh, it's very poor grain, but uh, uh, this is 1980s technology through a mini submarine. But you can see those thimbles are the nuclear fuel rods that have been totally destroyed. Now, at Three Mile Island, the reactor only was uh, without, without water for about 10 hours, maybe 12. Um, so for half a day it didn't have water cooling it. And also, it only ran for three months before, before the accident, which means there's very little decay heat. At Fukushima, on the other hand, that reactor ran for four years, so the fuel had an enormous amount of decay heat in, in it. And the other piece is that um, it was uncooled for many days. So more decay heat plus very little cooling tells me that the damage inside that core is enormous. TMI lost one third of its core. It wouldn't surprise me if there's 70 or 80 percent of the core that's been damaged. Now what that means is it falls to the bottom of the reactor as slag, radioactive slag, molten slag at the bottom of the reactor. At very least it's damaging those seals that I talk about at worst, it's gradually eating its way through the nuclear reactor and, uh, and a meltdown is possible. Combine this with the salt water they've been added, you have hot water, incredible um, source of heat and salt, um, corrosion of the vessels likely. 
the, the net effect here is that I believe that the uh, um, quantities of radiation that are going to continue to leak from that reactor into the containment and now apparently out of the containment are large and frankly I don't see how they're going to be stopped in the short term. Well, sorry it's kind of a gloomy picture today. Um, I will get back to you when I have more to tell you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds Associates. It's Thursday, March 31st, and you'll probably notice that this is the second update of a day. Normally I update you every other day. However, some, some disturbing video has shown up on Ustream that I wanted to talk to you about. First off, a little bit about my background. Um, I used to be an executive in the nuclear industry and one of the divisions I ran built nuclear fuel racks for boiling water reactors. So nuclear fuel racks are something that I know a little bit about. Nuclear fuel racks look like this. This is a square cans at the bottom of essentially a swimming pool and each can is designed to handle one nuclear fuel bundle and that's the glowing thing you see sliding into the, into the can. Now, the, the wrapper around those cans it has boron in it, and that's designed to prevent a nuclear chain reaction from occurring in the pool. You don't want a chain reaction to occur in the pool. That should occur in the reactor. Now, what happened at Fukushima was when the whole site lost power, at Fukushima 4, there was no reactor operating. All the fuel had been removed and was in the fuel pool. Now, normally the pools are cooled. However, they lost power, so there was no longer any, any cooling. It appears that the pools boiled dry. The uh, roof blew off the building. That indicates that hydrogen was built up from uh, something called a zircaloy water reaction that had to occur at temperatures over 2200 degrees. Now, after that, the Fukushima staff has been attempting to pour water into that reactor. And you can see in this picture that up the side of the building is a, uh, is a hydraulic device. It's actually designed for pumping concrete that's pumping water up and over the roof and pouring water into the nuclear fuel pool. Well, this picture is undated, but it, when it was taken, it clearly shows that there's no water in the pool. Now, if you look, there's a, there's a green, long green device, and that's the refueling bridge. Normally, that glides along on rails above the pool, and the pool is that crystal clear water that you normally are used to seeing. Well, after the explosion, it has collapsed and is lying in the pool. Now, between seconds 33 and 37 on this video, you can see little boxes. And the little boxes are just to the left of that green bridge. The boxes are in air. Those boxes are the top of nuclear fuel racks. They're supposed to be under 30 feet of water. They're not. Now what that means to me is a couple things. First off, the top of the nuclear fuel is exposed. Perhaps all the nuclear fuel is exposed, but certainly the top is. You can see steam coming up, but not from the top of the fuel. Down further in the cavity, there's steam coming up. So the water that they're spraying in is hitting the nuclear fuel and creating steam, but it's not filling that swimming pool. Now, the water has two purposes, cooling, but also shielding. So that means that the nuclear fuel is unshielded. That emits gamma rays. The gamma rays go up into the sky, bounce off of air molecules through something called sky shine, and rain back down on the site as a background radiation that's much higher than normal. That makes work on site really difficult, and it makes work on that refueling pool almost lethal. Now, the other thing it means to me is that the nuclear fuel itself is extraordinarily hot, and the plutonium inside can become volatile. Now, I spoke yesterday in the, in the uh, earlier update about cerium being discovered off-site and plutonium being discovered. And the fact that the nuclear fuel pool does not have water in it, to me, indicates that it might be a clean path for those heavy elements 
to be escaping from the building and being discovered off-site. Now, I would recommend, based on this, that the evacuation zones should be pushed back further because of these heavy elements being released, as well as the cesium that was also in those in those racks. Um, it does have some serious consequences. Um, as this situation develops, and perhaps more clear pictures uh, are, are available, I'll update you again. Thanks again. Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds Associates. Um, today is Thursday, March 31st, 2011. Um, in the last two days, the Fukushima plan has kind of been stable but precarious, kind of like balancing on the edge of a cliff but not going over and not being pulled back either. I wanted to um, give you my opinion of a couple of the more significant uh, pieces of information that have come out in the last two days. Uh, the, in, in broad terms, there's uh, very large amounts of liquid still being released to the environment, very large amounts of uh, gases still being released to the environment. And the other thing is that no one ever envisioned this type of recovery from an accident um, even a month ago before Fukushima happened. Well, let's talk about the liquid and gases uh, releases. The, uh, the New York Times is reporting that uh, 200 tons of radioactive liquid are being poured into the nuclear reactors and the fuel pool at Fukushima every day. Well, where's it going? If it's going in, it's coming out. And it's coming out two ways. It's coming out as radioactive steam and it's coming out as radioactive water. So if you're putting 200 tons in, 200 tons is coming out. In engineering terms, that's called feed and bleed. And what you're feeding in as clean water is bleeding out as radioactive steam and radioactive water. Well, there's some indications off-site that the uh, releases are very large. The fuel's clearly damaged, significantly damaged, and of course the releases are gonna be large with 200 tons of, of uh, releases every day. That boils down to a couple things. The IAEA, that's the International Atomic Energy Agency, has found that um, 25 miles away from the reactor, there's been deposition of radioactive material to the tune of 2 million becquerels per square meter. Now, what does that mean? A square meter is about 3 feet by 3 feet, a uh, meter by a meter, and uh, 2 mega becquerels is 2 million disintegrations every second is being deposited in roughly three feet by three feet. Now, that's well above what the IAEA would say you should evacuate <coughs> if the levels are that high. So there are, there are places out well beyond where the uh, Japanese are evacuating that should be evacuated based on the deposition of radioactive materials nearby. To give you a, a, an example, at Chernobyl, the exclusion zone was 500,000 becquerels. This is four times higher than Chernobyl. Now there are different isotopes and some of these will decay away and the Chernobyl ones are longer lived, but these are, are very serious concentrations of radioactivity being deposited on the ground from the radioactive steam coming out of the plant. The next thing is the water. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, incredibly high concentrations in the radioactive water in trenches on site. Um, there's indications that the survey meters simply can't rate, read high enough to measure the amount of radiation coming off the water. But and another indication is what's in the ocean. Uh, offshore radioactive readings in the ocean have gone up and are now over 3,000 3, times higher than the standards that are uh, routinely expected. That's not coming from the air. The ocean's too big to be, um, to be polluted by, by what's coming out of the airborne releases. It's clearly leaking from the trenches into the ocean. They haven't found the leak, but um, it, the only source of, of quantities of radioactive material uh, large enough to pollute the ocean has got to be leakage from these trenches. So with 200 tons of liquid going in and 200 tons of liquid going out, it's reasonable to expect that the, uh, the ocean is going to be polluted because uh, um, it's, it's clearly leaking in. Now, 
There's one other interesting reading that was detected on site. There are several what's called heavy elements that are being detected on the ground. Uh, we talked about plutonium in the last video, um, but there are some other ones too, something called cerium, which is also one of these that doesn't easily go volatile. And that it's on the ground also indicates um, significant fuel damage, most likely from the fuel pool in unit, uh, unit four. Well, it's important to realize that this feed and bleed operation that's going on was never anticipated a, a, a month ago by anyone who ever planned to mitigate an accident. A month ago, the worst accident that was ever assumed was 1% of the fuel in one reactor melted. We've got 70% of the fuel in three reactors melting. A month ago, we thought the containment would leak at half a percent per day. Um, now we know the containment is leaking much more than, than half a percent per day. And a month ago, we thought that the, um, th that the radioactivity would go high up a stack, and in fact, we're finding that the stacks don't work and the radiation's on the ground. The net effect of this is that in the Fukushima vicinity, exposures are probably 500 to 1,000 times higher than anticipated in the accident analysis that was, you know, that was reasonable um, a month ago. Also, a month ago, no one ever envisioned the possibility of a fuel pool burning. That's still a possibility. Um, Brookhaven National Labs, back in 1997, did a survey, did a study that said that the um, consequences of a fuel pool burning would be 137,000 fatalities from lung cancer. That's a serious um, study, and it's a number that we still need to be concerned about. Now, the difference between what, what's, what's happened and what we thought would happen is that everyone believed that the containment would contain, and it's not. The plan was that what was in the reactor would get recirculated in the reactor, and none of that material would come out into the groundwater. And so these exposures are much, much higher as a result of what's happened to Fukushima. Well, thank you very much, and I'll uh, get back to you as more develops. Arnie Gunderson with us now live. Arnie, you were with us very early and throughout this crisis, and you long argued it was worse than they were telling us. Uh, what do you make of this news now? And how could they have not known? Well, I'm not surprised. You know, they're saying now, these, these are all calculations. All of the instruments were blown to smithereens, so um, they're calculating what these exposures were. Um, how could they not know... Um, I think there was some confusion and there's some cultural issues too with the Japanese, but, but the biggest problem is this combination of being a regulator and a promoter of nuclear power. The, um, there's a revolving chairs situation in the Japanese structure where executives go to work for the regulator and the regulator goes to work for, for Tokyo Electric. And um, that makes it hard to really see how serious the accident is while you're in it. And, and as we try to judge the fallout, not only in Japan, and we'll see what that government report says, but we talked about some radiation, relatively low amounts, very low amounts, making its way across the Pacific. You've seen evidence of what's called hot, hot particles showing up on the U.S. West Coast in Seattle, for example. What are we talking about, and how worried should people be? Well, the, the radiation is... Um uh, initially comes out as a big cloud of gases and and that's what you can measure with a Geiger counter but now what we're finding are these things called hot particles and in the industry we call them fuel fleas because they're incredibly small they're smaller than uh, the, the thickness of your hair um, in Tokyo in April um, measurements indicate that there's about 10 hot particles per day in what a normal person would breathe and uh, it's interesting because in Seattle, uh, it didn't go down that much. It was about five hot particles a day. Um, because most of the time, as we talked about back in April, the, uh, the wind was blowing toward the West Coast. You know, that's why we were warning to uh, wash your lettuce and things like that. Now, what that means is that it's th these hot particles can lodge in your lung or in your digestive tract or your bone and, and over time cause a cancer. But they're way too small to be picked up on a, on a large radiation detector. And so do you believe there are enough of them that people in the West Coast of the United States need to be worried? Or is it a, a very minor concern? Well, the average person breathes in about um, uh, 
10 cubic meters a day. And uh, the, the filters out there for April show that they were breathing in, in a, per day about five particles. Now, these are charged, which is why we call them fuel fleas, too, and they latch on, on to lung tissue. Um, now, I'm still advising my friends to wash all of your vegetables to make sure you can get it off. Um, but short of that, we're at a point now where um, you just can't run from the, the particles that are still in the air. Hmm. We'll keep watching that. I want to show our viewers some satellite images that we have a then and now. Satellite images of the Fukushima nuclear plant on March 14th. Compare it to May 25th. Uh, when you look at this, three months since, uh, do you get the sense looking at the new photos, number one, first and foremost, do things appear to be under control right now? No, the, the units are still leaking. Um, the difference in the picture, though, is it was cold in March. So you could see steam, sort of like breathing on a, on a cold day. Um, now it's hot, so you don't see the steam coming out of the plant. But they're still emitting uh, radioactive gases and an enormous amount of radioactive liquid. So um, the only thing that's going to make this go away is time. They're going to need another year or so before this radioactive material cools down to the point where it doesn't boil anymore. And, and, and until it stops boiling, you're going to be cranking out steam and you're going to be cranking out radioactive liquid.